comfortable with your eyes closed. And imagine a great star of loving, living light above you. Feel streams of light washing over you and invite it to enter the top of your head and wash down through your body like a river washes through the sand on its bottom, carrying away any fatigue, fear, disease, or negativity. As all the darkness washes out of the bottoms of your feet, imagine Mother Earth taking it in as compost. Spend a little extra time washing any part of your body, mind, or spirit where there is tension, pain, or disease. Let the light wash clean the boundaries of your heart, revealing the inner light that is your own true essence. Let that heart light shine more and more brightly filling your cells and tissues, and then extending beyond your body, three feet above and below and on all sides, until you feel as if you are sitting in an egg of healing, protective light. And experience that sensation of protection in the silence. And now, consider letting my words be yours. May I be at peace. May my heart remain open. May I awaken to the light of my own true nature. May I be healed. May I be a source of healing for all beings. And now see a circle of divine light. Invite your loved ones into it, calling them by name. See them in as much detail as possible, imagining the loving light shining down on them and washing through them, revealing the light within their own hearts. And then bless them. May you be at peace. May your heart remain open. May you awaken to the light of your own true nature. May you be healed. May you be a source of healing for all beings. Now consider thinking of those people who you hold in judgment and to whom you are ready to begin extending forgiveness. Place them in a circle of light and see the light washing away all their negativity, just as it did for you and your loved ones, and bless them. May you be at peace. May your heart remain open. May you awaken to the light of your own true nature May you be healed, and may you be a source of healing for all beings. See our beautiful planet as it appears from outer space, a delicate jewel hanging in the starry vastness. Imagine the earth surrounded by light, the green continents, the blue waters, 
and the white polar caps. The two-leggeds, four-leggeds, fish, birds, and things that creep and crawl. May there be peace on earth. May the hearts of all people be open to themselves and to each other. May all people awaken to the light of their own true nature. May all creation be blessed and be a blessing to all. In God's name, amen. I'd like to, to thank the band for accommodating my request for that song. Okay, so the first thing I want to say is that I'm a crier, <laughs> and part of my recovery has been becoming okay with that. Um, so when my heart is touched, like with that song, the tears come up, and they're supposed to, and it's okay with me. I hope it'll be okay with you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my background and what's happened in my life and where I'm at now. Um, I was raised in a conservative Methodist church. Um, my parents were very active in the church, and um, our social life centered around the church. And in that church, I was taught to believe that God was a punishing, vengeful, vengeful God and a pretty scary God. And um, that if I broke the rules and I didn't obey the Bible, um, I would be punished. And so when I observed what was going on in the world, I, um, you know, I saw man-made famines and I saw a little girl running down the road on fire, um, I began to get angry at God. And um, at that time, I was channeling that anger into uh, working for peace and justice, and um, my family was really supportive of that. Um, my Parents also taught me to befriend and help the most vulnerable people by what they did in our community and how they treated other people. And they taught me to work for peace and justice. I was in grade school when I was on my first picket line. We were demonstrating in front of Gegner's Barber Shop because it was white only. Thank you. Um, my father and I rode a bus to Washington to be at the Pe Poor People's March. And um, I really admired my father. He was a social worker and the only white employee of a inner city um, poverty nonprofit in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, he was a very altruistic man. Um, underneath his altruism, there was also a lot of that anger. And um, I think a big part of his anger was uh, related to being a conscientious objector in World War II um, on religious grounds. He did not want to be involved in killing anything or anybody. And um, he was uh, sent to a work camp in Washington State and uh, was forced to be away from um, my mom during her first pregnancy, which I think was traumatic for both of them. But I think um, what was really the source of his anger was that when he came back, he applied for a lot of um, civil service jobs and because of the veterans' points, um, he was pretty much 
prevented from getting any social work jobs in his field, and his, he never really had very much earning power because of that. I moved to Madison when I was 20. At that time, I was with a guy who had two very uh, rambunctious sons. So I was a stepmom. I graduated from the UW in social work, and I, uh, my first job was a very um, challenging job, job with um, street people in Madison. And I was also um, involved in union organizing and union negotiating. And it was really too much for me. I started to burn out. I was um, going to union meetings during my lunch hours, and um, we were drinking quite a bit. And um, my family, my son started acting out more, and um, I was self-medicating with alcohol and started having um, migraine headaches. And the result of um, the medical care that I was getting was that I ended up in substance abuse treatment. And that was about in my mid-30s. Um, in treatment, I learned that it was my responsibility to carve out a life for myself that I could be happy in. And I needed to sort out my own identity and priorities and values separate from the way I was raised. And um, really, I didn't have a clue about my place in the world at that time. My counselor turned to me one day and he said, Ellen, do you really think you have that much power to ruin that many people's lives? And um, I was deeply immersed in the 12-step uh, recovery community, which encouraged us to turn our will and our, our lives over to the care of a higher power. And my higher power at that time, I really didn't trust. I was still afraid of God, and I still perceived God as a punishing God. So I kind of made the... 12-step recovery people, my God, for a while, because they were very loving and they were taking very good care of me. And gradually I just started model, modeling my idea of a higher power after them. I also started getting some hindsight after a while and looking back on the most painful parts of my life and realizing that they were actually the time when my spiritual growth was accelerating greatly. And I started to realize that God wasn't doing this stuff to me. God was offering these opportunities to me for growth. And uh, unity's third principle, we create our life experiences through our way of thinking. Um, that was really happening. I was thinking differently about who God was and what my relationship to God was and my place in the world. And it's really made a big difference. It's relieved me of a huge burden um, to really kind of act as God in the world. One of our principles at Unity is God is all there is, present everywhere, and absolute good. And I really trust that. I believe that. In spite of the appearances of some of the circumstances in our world. Um, which is also part of the relief, I feel. And if I can choke through this um, piece I'd like to read you... <laughs> Um, from Julia Cameron, my spirit is large enough for any circumstance. I am enough. I have wisdom enough. I have faith enough. 
I know enough. I do not need to strive or strain. I do not need to reach or worry. I am enough. I allow the universe to act through me. The universe is more than enough. And so am I. Um, I was mentoring other women in the 12-step program I was in, but I really didn't trust myself to be involved in community um, organizing or change um, organizations. So I pretty much went cold turkey from being involved in the community in general. But I did um, have an opportunity to... Um, lived for a while with my 10-year-old at La Samaritan Community, which is a Christian community that at, in the 90s um, was on Williamson Street. And we, we prayed together twice a day, and we were able to host refugees and uh, were responsible for setting up Luke House Meal Program. So that was very empowering, and that felt very safe because it was in a group and I could trust other people's boundaries. At that time, I also felt empowered to uh, do some tax resisting during the Gulf War. And I was self-employed at the time, and I withheld two quarterly tax payments in protest for, from, for the war. Um, it didn't take long for the uh, federal government to start sending me scary, threatening letters about what they were going to do to me and my family. <laughs> and um, I remembered my father's experience, and I decided that I didn't want to be bitter and angry the way he was. So I made up my tax bill, and um, I grieved because I felt on some level that I was a failure. But that was exactly what they were talking about when they said I needed to sort out my own identity and what worked for me. And going up against Uncle Sam was not working for me. <laughs> so I have spent um, a couple of decades really sorting out uh, what need to be my boundaries. And um, certain life events have taught me that they can't be written in stone, they have to be flexible. There are times when I can extend myself, and it's healthy for me to do that, and it's joyful. And there are times when I just can't, and I need to say no. And um, the first principle of unity, God is always present in every situation and working for our good, assures me that if my answer has to be no, the universe is enough for, you know, helping the other person or doing what needs to be done. I trust my gut. If my gut's saying, I really don't want to do that for that person, I kind of trust that... Um, there's probably a lesson that I'd be preventing that person from learning and I would be in the way of their growth if I went ahead and did what someone wanted me to do even though I didn't want to. And I also um, am very careful about keeping my self-care commitments to myself. Um, if you need something done and you ask me to do it on a Friday morning during my dance meditation, the answer is going to be no. My dance sisters know what I'm talking um, I've also been involved in the um, social justice intention group at Unity. Um, there's a scientist, and I forget her first name, but her last name is McTaggart. Lynn McTaggart, and um, I've seen um, some stuff online about her research with um, what happens when a small group of thoughtful people get together and pray with a positive intention for change 
somewhere in the world um, that they're really getting results. And so I feel like being part of the intention group, thank you Kay Frazier, um, for me it's a, it's a pretty safe way um, to make a difference. And uh, as we know, the unity principles say that it's not enough just to know the truth. We have to live it. And the social justice ministry here is also a source of support for me. Um, we get together monthly, and sometimes we have social gatherings um, to just chat with each other and bond. And um, these are all really active individuals that are really committed to um, a variety of different things that we do in the community. We don't always do them together, but we get together monthly and we update each other. And I think we um, are pretty good at supporting each other to keep it within a healthy perspective, too. I'm very grateful. And I'd like to end with um, a reading written by Margaret Mead, and many of you are familiar with this. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing it ever has. Thank you.